man, it was good to see you in the Daytona 500, Greg. It was, uh, it was awesome, man. It's, uh, man, when that, when we heard that you were going to drive in the Daytona 500, man, it was like, man, what a, what a story that'd be if Biff could take a brand new team and, and put the, you know, in the first next gen car, put it in victory lane, just to be out there was pretty awesome. You know, what do you think about the new car and what's your opinion of it? You know, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting uh, to hear your opinion of it, but it's interesting, like a lot of the powerhouse teams that were building chassis and have an advantage arrow wise and have all the technology and the resources. It's kind of interesting that now, you know, the steel, the powerhouse teams are still going to have the funding and, and the backing from the manufacturers and all the technology you could ever want. But what's it like, you know, to race where, you know, the same guy, you can buy the same parts and pieces. It's almost, you know, it's not, but it's almost like an IROC car, you know what I mean? But the steel, the powerhouses, teams are still going to find a way to get to the front. Right. It, and I mean, you're right. We, we call it, you know, we call it the who's got the best mousetrap, right? Yeah. It, and so who can take what they're given within the rules and make it better than everyone else? That's what we try and do. And that's the, you know, that's pushing the edge, pushing the envelope, getting in that gray area. That's why these guys get in trouble. That's why they go through tech three times and don't get to qualify or lose their crew chief because they're pushing the edge and pushing that envelope and they understand they have all the engineers and resources they understand what makes speed in the car um i i when i first saw the car i was a little it's kind of funny how this how this happened because i went to riley uh motorsports here in mooresville and went and looked at it uh LMP3 car and looked at a uh, Trans Am, you know, Trans Am car that a TA2 car. So I'm wandering through the shop looking at these, uh, all these cars. And I think they had a GT3 and a GT4. So they had a bunch of stuff. And I was Google eyeing over it because it's all carbon, you know, it's all really, really badass stuff. Right. And then I go to RCR where the, the, the car was this car I've been talking with John about for two years now, you know, it's like, I'm going to build a car. I'm going to, I'm going to go race and will you drive it? And so this build up, he finally, I'm like, I got to go see this, you know, because we've been talking about it for a while. But honestly, when I saw it, I was, I was a little taken back. I was kind of surprised. It's, it's hard to explain. They have some really great ingenuity on some items and then it's like some stuff it looks like you know where we've kind of taken a few steps back or they have right um two by three rectangle upper frame rails instead of a piece of round tube yeah just you know uh it looked like a tractor to me when it was <laughs> sitting there instead of a race car and they didn't make it very sexy let's put it that way right and but they, they, I love the independent rear suspension. I love mm -hmm. the rack and pinion steering in the front. Uh, ergonomics inside is not bad. Uh, the dash seems a little bit too high for, for a lot of the drivers. So <clears throat> you have to sit pretty high in the car. Pretty high CG center right. of gravity for a race car. Race cars kind of low to the ground and, and you see, you know, kind of a low center of gravity. Right. I'm not going to blame that you know, the 17 car flipping down the front stretch, which we saw right in the 600. I'm not going to blame that on center of gravity, but I'll tell you, it makes a difference when you get a car that's short and wide versus kind of taller and, and narrower in the weight. You know, it, it probably helped that thing, you know, tumble more than it, than it may have. But overall, I think they've narrowed up that box. And ultimately, it's going to save the team's money down the road. It's cost them tremendously now, right. but it will eventually save them money down the road. And you're right, David. You hit it on the head. The big powerhouse teams are going to continue to figure out how to get the thing the best because they have 30 engineers figuring out. You know, they're they're taking, from what I understand, they're taking these bodies that are that are made by a company, five star, and putting them in the oven. And heating them up to to comp, you know, to mold, yeah. reshape the body panel, just a, 
you know, that 10 thousandths, that 50 thousandths of an inch, maximizing, you know, to the template everywhere. The, the small teams, one, don't have the resource to know where to do that at. And, you know, plus the expense and the people and the man hours, these 44 guys, uh, you know, they have a hard time making every other event, just getting everything prepared. So it's, uh, you know, putting the thing in the oven and heating it up and bending it, you know, you gotta, there, there's a lot to it. So, 